Kaina mana ene iwi tēnā koutou katoa te whare wahanga o Waitaha. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hey, welcome everybody. It's great to have you all here. It's a special privilege for me to introduce Rob Fife to you. Uh, let me tell you very quickly a little about Rob. He's a Christchurch boy. Uh, went to Burnside, so hasn't come far from home. Um, not only that, he's a University of Canterbury engineering grad, so it's double the claim. In addition, uh, I first met Rob nearly 30 years ago now, when he came to the Bank of New Zealand along with Lindsay Pines and Post Bank. And you remember back then the Bank of New Zealand spectacularly lost all its shareholders' funds, and I think that became the first of a number of turnarounds that Rob was involved in. Um, not to say any of the next sequence were turnarounds, but after that, uh, Rob spent time with National Australia Bank in Australia, sorting out their operations and back office stuff. Uh, also spent time uh, as the Chief Executive of Air New Zealand, uh, a role in which he featured a number of television ads, movies, other things, um, but is currently the Chief Executive of Icebreaker, an iconic New Zealand company, and in addition, serves as a Director of Antarctic New Zealand, a particular connection the University of Canterbury has through our Gateway Antarctic uh, endeavours and research activities. Uh, Rob's also on Craigie Wine's board, uh, so uh, another particular role, and the Asia Foundation. So somebody who has been involved in many lines of business in New Zealand, has featured prominently in a number of success stories, uh, and is currently able to share with us some of that background, interest, experiences. And Rob, the floor is yours. Uh, great, thanks Rod. Uh, Unlike Rod, I actually really dislike public speaking, so I'm here somewhat reluctantly. I'd probably prefer to be at the dentist, to be honest, but <laughs> anyway, uh, nothing against any of you good folk, of course, but it's, uh, despite doing a reasonable amount of it, I still never get that uh, comfortable. Uh, I do feel a deep sense of connection uh, to the university, you know, I came here uh, actually, at the time, I was on a program with the Air Force, and you could join the Air Force, and they'd put you through a university degree, and we used to come to uh, university in our Air Force uniforms. Uh, great fun. Uh, but I learned a lot here, and despite the fact I would no longer call myself an engineer, the foundation of learning and problem-solving uh, that was established for me in those early years has been invaluable to me throughout my career. And I love fixing broken things. <laughs> um, I've always been interested in leaders and, and leadership. And I, I'm particularly drawn to leaders that have been able to challenge the status quo, to, I guess, find new ways of solving age-old uh, problems, are uh, prepared to push against the crowd, are prepared to bring a sense of identity, of personality, a new perspective uh, to a challenge. And also throughout my career, I've been uh, really drawn to taking risks. I'm qu I've been quite a risk taker, both at a personal level and also in the context of um, how I approach opportunities, and I'm a big believer uh, in trial and error. Uh, I'm not sure I mentioned that to uh, John Palmer when he was offering me the job at Air New Zealand, but uh, I'll talk a little about that uh, as we go along. At the heart of my leadership uh, philosophy is a, is a belief that business success is ultimately all about people. Uh, it's about their personality, their motivation, their commitment, their teamwork, their clarity of vision, their ability to communicate with each other, uh, their integrity, and their relationships. And in my experience, a highly motivated team of people working to cohesively together, focused on a common goal, will almost inevitably outperform another competitor that's focused on the bottom line and financial performance and just solving the next issue or problem. Uh, that comes along, even if that opposition has more scale or even technical superiority. And I say almost always, I'll share at least one example where that wasn't the case, but there's always an exception to the rule. Um, 
I think I've still got heaps to learn as a leader, and my philosophy is that you are always learning. I'm drawn to constantly putting myself in situations where I don't know anything about uh, that business uh, or that challenge or that opportunity. That actually motivates me and excites me. Uh, and I'm, as I say, I hope that I, uh, that I never stop learning. So I thought I'd start with a few insights uh, about me and kind of what motivates me <clears throat> before I talk about some of the lessons I've learned along the way uh, about leadership. I'm incessantly curious. I, I love figuring out uh, how and why things work. You know, I was one of those little kids that was pulling the toaster together and trying to put it apart and then trying to put it back together and figure out how it worked at home as a kid. There's always bits left over. But, um, and, and as Rod mentioned, I started my uh, career as an engineer, which I found was a great platform for, for training the mind around problem solving. I love engaging with people. I love challenging people. I love seeing people grow uh, and develop. Uh, I'm driven to live, I guess, what I'd describe as an adventurous life. You know, I, I hate being surrounded by sameness. I want to cram as much into my life as I can. Uh, I love going fast. I'm, I'm a little bit competitive. Um, and as I mentioned, I love challenging the status quo and taking risks. I've worked in many different companies and many different industries and in different countries around the world. And along the way, I have learned some valuable lessons, which I guess I've, I've built as a foundation of, of what I guess I'd call my leadership style and philosophy. Um, and I'm continuing to learn. So I wanted to start initially and talk about risk. And I'm going to try and illustrate as much as I can by telling stories. I'm a strong believer that people learn far more effectively through the sharing of practical illustrations, examples, stories than they do listening to theory and concepts and, and more elusive, I guess, frameworks. That's how it works for me anyway. And the first example I was going to talk about is I, I joined a company a little over uh, 15 years ago called ITV Digital. It was a pay TV platform in the UK. You probably won't have heard of it because uh, it failed uh, uh, 14 years ago. Um, of which, given that I was managing director at the time, I feel some strong uh, responsibility for. At the time when I joined uh, that company, it was the recently launched pay TV platform of ITV Digital. It had been running for about a year and a half. Uh, and ITV was the largest commercial free-to-air channel in the UK, uh, funded by advertising revenue. Uh, but all the growth was happening in pay TV. So B Sky B was the big gorilla in the market, uh, which I built that business off the back of, of football rights. And we'd come along with a different technology to see if we could challenge their supremacy in the market. I went to the business because at the time they were struggling to build their subscriber base. They couldn't create a point of difference. They couldn't convince people why they should sign up to ITV uh, versus B Sky B. I spent 18 months exploring options for how we could build that business. And on one level, we were very successful. Uh, at the time, before we put the business into bankruptcy, we were gaining subscribers at 50,000 a month, and we were hiring staff at the rate of 60 a week. Uh, so at one level, that looks like a fabulous business. The problem was the technology platform wasn't working very well. So the concept was you could just, through your normal aerial on the roof, you could get 50 channels of pay TV. It was called digital terrestrial TV. You didn't need a satellite dish. You didn't need someone digging up your lawn to put a, uh, to put a cable in. Uh, but the problem was we were selling the subscription. A lot of people were getting it home and finding that they couldn't get the signal. They weren't in coverage, which is a bummer if you've just bought the box that day to be able to watch the, uh, the football that afternoon. 
uh, which was our key USP, is you could just plug the box in yourself and off you went. So sadly we were churning subscribers at 50,000 a month as well. Um, so I, w I was the one that got the job of going to the shareholders after being there for about 12 months and saying, um, you need to close this business down, it's not going to be successful. The only way you could make it successful is to reduce the number of channels so you could power up the strength of each signal, uh, but that meant we could only deliver five channels and it was never going to be feasible. The shareholders had invested uh, $3 billion by that stage in the business, uh, and they wrote the whole lot off. So often I hear people talking about risk, particularly in a corporate environment, and they love talking about risk, but the sense of the consequence of failure is so high that people really don't step up and take risk. Uh, and I wanted to share that example because that was the job I did immediately prior to joining Air New Zealand. And there was a gap. I came home from, uh, from Europe. That, was a, that job was based in London. I had six months break before I started at Air New Zealand. But the interesting thing for me is, is I learned so much through that experience that when I looked for my next job, I didn't find that failure a hindrance to my next job opportunity. In fact, when I could talk about the learnings I gained through that process about why that business failed, what, what worked, what didn't work, managing people through that whole journey, uh, many of the prospective employers I spoke to uh, saw that actually as a strength in my CV uh, rather than a weakness. Um, what I'd like to do though is ask you to reflect on your appetite for risk. Uh, as we go through the chat this afternoon. Many people love the idea of, I want to be entrepreneurial, I want to take risk, I want to be different. But that innate fear of failure, that innate fear of not conforming to the expectation around you from your family, your friends, your peer group, often is an inhibitor. And I see a lot of people starting out on their careers that get really torn by these challenges of, perceiving that I want to be on this entrepreneurial path, this risk-taking path, but they've got these other forces pulling them in a different direction. I think it's really important to shape your sense of what your appetite for risk is, not just taking risk, but failing, uh, and whether you're comfortable to fail along the way. One of the things I learned about myself very, very early on in my career is that I'm, I'm a pragmatist, not a theorist. I've discovered, as I mentioned, that I believe people learn a lot faster through being exposed to practical examples, to storytelling. I think storytelling is incredibly important, as important today as it was centuries ago, uh, as a means of passing knowledge and information uh, from one generation to the next, or from one person to the next, or from one community uh, to the next. One of the things I did when I was at Air New Zealand is we stopped using terms like vision, mission and values. Um, we, kinda, we, we didn't exactly outlaw them, uh, but I would never use those terms. You know, if I went up to a baggage handler on the flight line and started talking about vision, mission and values, you could guarantee they would glaze over and they'd be thinking about the rugby or something else. I mean, it's just not a language that's accessible to that individual. It has no relevance. And you can't create these kind of wind shares in your organisation where you say, well, everyone up at this level can talk about vision, mission and values, but we won't talk about it down at this level. You have to create a common lexicon through your organisation where people are communicating and engaging with the concepts of what the business is about in the same language. So we stopped using terms uh, like that. Um, instead, we focus on trying to shape our identity, our sense of purpose, our sense of who we are, by sharing stories, by sharing examples. Um, one of the key philosophies at Air New Zealand was we were trying to move the business from being centred around planes to being centred around people. And airlines for the most part, 
are centred around planes. Which ones to buy, where to fly them, how much to charge for a seat, which galleys to put on board, which engines to put on board. The people working with the planes, the pilots, the engineers, they're typically seen as the kind of the elite people in the airline and everyone else is the, is the support people in the Air Force. My early days in the Air Force, we used to refer to the pilots as the sharps and everyone else was the blunts, um, which is kind of quite a clear illustration of your status in the pecking order. I was a blunt. Um, so we tried to turn that on its head and say actually where the value transaction occurs in an airline is when people interact with people. The value transaction occurs when you check in with, with the check-in agent and have a good or a bad experience. The value transaction occurs when you interact with a flight attendant and she's grumpy or she's happy or he looks, he scowls at you or you know, he dumps a coffee on your tray. Those are the things that define the experience as you're thinking next time about will I book with that same airline again or won't I determine that choice. The pilot or the engineer doesn't have much to do with that. Their job is kind of binary. They either get you to your destination or they don't. Um, <laughs> and we like to think that uh, on the vast majority of occasions they will. So it's all about the impact at the margin of people interacting with people. And it was a big challenge in that organisation to shift the culture to say, actually, you know what? Yes, the pilot has a very important job. Yes, the engineer has a very important job. But actually the heroes in the eyes of our customers are far more often, all the villains, are far more often than not the people at that point of, of interface, of which there's many thousands of them uh, across the business. So we thought about shaping the organisation by sh constantly sharing stories that set the bench mark the, set the kind of the hurdle for how we expected people to behave and interact with our customers. And I'll share a few examples with you to illustrate uh, points through this, uh, through this presentation. Well, in fact, I'll share one now. I used to, every week, I used to write an email out to our 11,000 employees, and each week I'd try and share a customer story, because customers would write to me and share their stories with me. Um, and I remember one, uh, one particular story. We had a, uh, this chap writes to me and said, I was on my way home from a, uh, a business meeting in Sydney, and I got the last fly flight out of Sydney, lands in Auckland about 11.30. I was seated down the back of the aircraft, and I ha happened to be seated next to an off-duty flight attendant, and she recognised me from a previous flight. She knew I was a, a regular customer, so she went up the front and got me a glass of champagne and a few things and looked after me really well. It was really nice. said, so anyway, we landed in, uh, in uh, Auckland. And he said, my car was uh, parked in the car park and I was planning to jump in my car and drive downtown and get the ferry across to Waiheke Island. Uh, and that was the last ferry that night. He said, when I landed, I went into the uh, baggage place to collect my bag and they'd lost my bag. I think he'd connected off a Qantas flight or something, I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know. um, but they'd lost my bag and my car keys were in it, I couldn't get my car. So the same flight attendant walked out of the terminal, saw me standing there on the uh, pavement looking a, a little forlorn and asked me what the problem was and, and I explained it to her and she said, well, why don't you come uh, home with, uh, with me and you can stay the night at my place uh, <laughs> and... and you can have breakfast with me and my husband and my kids. Uh, uh, the next morning I'll bring you back out and we'll find your bag. And she says, so sure enough, I went home with this flight attendant. She put me up in the spare room in their home and her husband took me out to the airport the next morning. We got my bag and he was saying, what an amazing, amazing experience, right? Well, you're never going to script that in the policy manual. You know, if you find stray passenger, <laughs> take them home. It could create all sorts of issues, as you would imagine. Um, health and safety being the least of them. So, so but, but when you share a story like that, and I shared that story in my, in my email that week, you actually start people thinking. It caused me to think. I thought, would I have done that? And the reality is, if I can't come out of the terminal, I probably wouldn't have made that gesture to that passenger. Yet one of our employees was prepared to go that far to create a great customer experience, 
And they started, the other people thinking, and over the course of my time at Air New Zealand, that was a few years in, we had heaps of examples of people taking passengers home for all the right reasons. Um, <laughs> but the one sad part to uh, conclusion to that story, we're all over 18 here, yes. Um, sad conclusion to that story is the flight attendant involved was this very... Uh, uh, very well presented flight attendant. She'd probably been with the airline for 20 years. Her hair was always perfect, her makeup and so on. And I rang her up on that Friday night to say, look, I'd had this lovely email. I'd always provide the feedback to, uh, to our staff. I'd had this lovely email from this passenger. Um, it was amazing what you did. I think it was about 7 o'clock on Friday night. And I could hear her husband in the background, who also worked for uh, Air New Zealand, uh, saying, Sue, come on, we're late. Uh, and she turned around to him and said, I won't be a minute, I'm just on the phone uh, to Rob Fife. To which he said, stop fucking around, we're in a hurry, uh, we need a dash. Um, and every time I bumped into her after that, she'd go bright red and it's kind of like, really defeated the whole purpose of providing uh, good feedback. But, but I, I used to get about 100 emails a day, about 70 from... Uh, from customers, about 30 from staff around the business. My mantra was that I would always personally respond to everyone that, that communicated with me as a sign of respect. If they thought it was important enough to engage with the CEO, they deserve the respect of a response from the CEO. Now that was probably three to three and a half hours of my day, every day. Um, normally when I got home actually, that's what I did between about eight and, and, and 11 in the evening. But the value of that over a seven or eight year career of interacting you know, with a couple of hundred thousand communications with people in a country the size of New Zealand can have an enormous influence. And the richness of stories that flowed from those communications that then gave me a platform to communicate with people what our standards were, where we set the bar and actually motivate people to go further was the impact that had was phenomenal. People were constantly exceeding expectations I would have ever set uh, for them in their interactions with, with consumers. Um, another lesson I've learned along the way is that effective leadership, certainly for me, is not about knowing the answers. It's actually about knowing the right questions to ask. Now, when I went and worked for that TV company, when I work for Air New Zealand, um, or now working at Icebreaker, I'm surrounded by people in those roles that know far more about that industry than I do. I'm the new kid on the block. The, the role of a leader, an effective leader, is not to, to come to the role with the answers. It's about how you draw out from people the, the ideas, the knowledge that's within them, how you give them a, a sense of purpose. <coughs> Uh, it's about how you motivate them to be looking for opportunities every day to make a difference in what they do. But the knowledge, the answers, sit with them, uh, not with you. Uh, I'm just trying to join the dots. And when I, when I reflect on some of the amazing innovations uh, that came out of Air New Zealand, during the time I was there and continue to come out of Air New Zealand, the vast majority of those ideas came from challenging people with seemingly impossible challenges and leaving them to go away and figure out if those challenges could be solved. I remember when I said to our interior design team, how can we get people to be able to lie down in economy class, but you can't have any more space per seat? Or, or the economics won't work. Well, that sounds like a problem you can't solve. But the guys came up with an idea which ultimately became our sky couch that said, well, actually you could create these footrests that fold up between the two seats to make a flat sleeping platform that a couple of people could sleep on. And we've figured out the economics that if those two people have paid for a seat each, we can give them the third seat for half price and then they can cuddle up on a couch. I mean, it's amazing, simple technology, but amazing innovation from a seemingly intractable challenge. I can remember I came back from 
a trip to Europe for a friend's wedding and we've fl flown on Ryanair uh, <laughs> to a place called Rimini in Italy from, uh, from somewhere in, uh, in, in the UK. And I've actually got a lot of respect for Ryanair. You know, their, their basic principle of their business model is if you promise your passengers absolutely nothing and you give them a tiny bit more than nothing, then people actually feel quite good about it. You know, you kind of, it's all about exceeding expectations. Anyway, I, so I was okay with it, to be honest, because I went in thinking it was going to be absolute hell and it was slightly better than hell. So. <laughs> but I got home and I said to my marketing team, I said, look, these guys do these one pound airfares. We need to be able to do some one dollar airfares. It was before Jetstar had arrived and so on. We knew they were going to be really aggressive, so we thought we need to get in and and stake out our ground in advance. So I said, how do we do some one dollar airfares? And I, kinda, I couldn't quite figure out how they could make it work. Anyway, the marketing team went away, came up with this idea called grab a seat and said, look, we can do some cheap airfares. We'll use the seats that we don't think would otherwise sell. And, and anyway, they came up with this plan and, and they walked out of my office having presented it to me and the finance team came in and said, don't believe anything the marketing guys say. <laughs> if you implement this, you'll convince everyone that fares are really cheap and no one will buy the more expensive fares and we only make a 2% profit margin and we'll dilute the average fare price and it'll be a disaster. So I got them both back in together, you know, like you do with kids that have kind of got a different point of view and, and we said, I said to the finance guys, I said, so what do your numbers say? What's this going to cost us? And they said, well, we reckon it's going to cost us half a million dollars a week. And the marketing guys gave me all their numbers about how they thought it was going to build our sales and so on. So we said, well, let's run it for eight weeks. It's, if the finance guys are right, it'll cost us $4 million. If the marketing guys are right, we're going to, this is going to be the gateway to a whole new way of doing business. Um, and if, it, if the marketing guys are wrong and finance guys are right, at the end of eight weeks we'll say it was just a promotion and we would spend $4 million on a big kind of marketing promotion, so at the time that seemed reasonable. Taking that risk and trialling that idea took us from, at the time we were doing $150 million a year of revenue on our online website. Um, within four years uh, we'd hit the billion dollar mark. Uh, we'd gone from a big day on our website being 30,000 visitors a day uh, to a big day on the website being half a million visitors a day. Uh, and the primary driver of that was the publicity that we were creating around Grab a Seat. It was an amazing success uh, for Air New Zealand. What we found is if people didn't find a cheap fare on Grab a Seat, they'd often click through to the main Air New Zealand site, so we'd still get the business for a, a full price fare uh, anyway. Uh, but it's all about taking risks. But that idea, as I say, I, I, all I did was ask the questions and challenge people to find new ways to solve problems. And it wasn't always me asking the question, often it was one of my team or someone else uh, in the business. I've also learnt that the customer isn't always right. But if a customer engages with you, they deserve the respect of your time and attention, no matter what position you occupy in the, in the company. Um, and I thought again, I'll share another little story uh, to bring that to life. So one of, one of these emails I got from a customer one day was from a chap down in Otago, a very uh, well-known family down there, and he was flying from Auckland to Dunedin. And he wrote to me to say, we left the gate on time, we got pushed back from the gate, we taxied out to the runway, and then we stopped there for 30 minutes whilst they fixed the problem with a heater. Uh, and he said, surely we could have flown to Dunedin without this heater. And he then went on to say, he said, yeah, in fact, these days I'm very disappointed with my uh, service from Air New Zealand. He said, uh, my flights are never on time. And he went on to say, you know, it was quite a long email, and the closing line, which I still remember, because this was eight years ago, I think, the closing line from the email uh, was, your service is lower than a snake's scrotum. <laughs> so um, I don't know a lot about snakes, but uh, kind of... You don't have to know too much about the anatomy to figure out, you know, the, the point was he didn't have much respect for our quality of service. So, so I wrote back to this, uh, this chap and 
I apologise for the problem with the heater. It's actually a heater in the PITO system which measures airspeed, which is pretty important to flight safety. So the pilot made the right decision. But I apologise for the fact that his flight was delayed. But I said, I, I don't, didn't think it was fair that he characterised our flights as always being um, late. I said 90% of the flights are on time and we've got the best performance of any airline in Australasia. He wrote back to me to say that... Uh, uh, that he'd like to wager me two bottles of his best red wine that his next two flights wouldn't be on time. So I said I, I'd happily uh, accept his wager. Um, and so uh, that week in my, uh, my email to our 11,000 employees, I shared this correspondence uh, with this customer alo along with the details of when his next two flights were in. And, <laughs> and, and, um, that, that following few weeks, I was bombarded by hundreds of emails from people all over in New Zealand telling me what they were doing to make sure his next two flights were on time. <laughs> um, what they didn't tell me, because I would have never condoned it, was that for one of those flights they actually had a spare 737 on standby in case, <laughs> in case there was a problem with his one. I, I hate to think what it cost, but, <laughs> but anyway, his, his flights took off on time. Uh, they landed early. And duly, two bottles of red wine arrived in my office. And a couple of weeks after that, I get this email from this chap asking me if, my, uh, if I'd enjoyed the wine. It was French wine, it very, looked very lovely. And I wrote back to him saying, well, actually, I hadn't drunk it. I said, if I had to share it with everyone involved in getting your flights off on time, it would be a bit like communion. So I, I said, I'd, I, said I'd, I was being optioned for someone to come and spend a day with me for a charity we support, Corocare. Um, down here in Christchurch actually, which is run by a fabulous group of people. Um, and they put me in this charity auction and I said, if I've got your wine as part of the deal, at least someone will you know, pay a few hundred dollars to spend the day with me. So anyway, so in the end someone bid $18,000 to come and spend the day with me and said they didn't like red wine. He'd sent down another half dozen bottles to go with the other two because he thought it was a good idea. We auctioned that off for a couple of thousand dollars and I wrote him an email saying we got $20,000 he went around the company saying how a country telling everyone he was my best mate and <laughs> and you know the interesting part of that story for me again you know I shared that story people can learn a lot more about customer service hearing that story about how you can turn a complaint into a, a complainant into an advocate uh, the links people went to far exceeded uh, what I expected or, or would have condoned obviously uh, but that's cool. The fact that people actually felt in the organisation they could make those decisions to create those outcomes without needing someone to instruct them what to do, that to my mind is the definition of leadership. And increasingly, the longer I was in my role at Air New Zealand, the more comfortable I felt that I could be away, I could be on holiday, things could happen, and I had absolute confidence that the people around me would make decisions that were at least as good as, if not better, than the decisions I would have made if I was sitting in the seat when that same situation occurred. I've also learnt over the years that in the highly connected world in which we now live, it doesn't matter where you live, whether you live in New York or Auckland or Christchurch, or Geraldine, or wherever you may live, if you want to sell a product or service, you better strive to be globally relevant and to make sure you're creating a world-class product and service. Because I can guarantee you that there are global competitors out there that are targeting your local customers today. Um, and again, you know, if I use a very simple uh, example, I was in the States uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'd been at a, a little festival in Nevada called Burning Man with my, um, with my partner. Um, if you haven't heard of it, actually, you can, if you Google that, it'll give you a sense of what an adventurous life can be. Um, but anyway, we're on our way home from Burning Man, and we were, in our, we were driving into LA, and I needed a pair of socks, you know, like those little invisible socks that you wear with sneakers and stuff that don't show. Um, we don't make them at Icebreaker, otherwise I'd be wearing, wearing those ones, of course. But anyway, we don't. So I went into the store, and they had the vacuum-packed bag of three pairs of these socks. So I brought these socks. We're on our way to the airport, got home. I put some of these socks on, 
and they are amazing, right? I hate those socks normally because they fall off your heel and they scrunch up around your toes. And Anyway, these socks are great. So the first thing I did, like within a week, I thought, God, I, I need some more of these socks. So I've already ordered three more bags of these socks. So I'm buying $20 socks now from the store in LA rather than going downtown Auckland to the sock shop to buy my socks. Um, because I perceive that that sock, compared to anything else I've worn, is world class. You know, why, why would you bother to buy your socks from LA, right? And it's not like they're some designer sock, they just work. But that is the reality. Whatever product or service any of us provide or offer in the world today, there is someone that can access your customer, whether your customer is right next door or whether your customer lives in another country, can access that customer and provide them with a world-class uh, alternative. Um, what that in, in turn has taught me, and I, could, you know, I, I see examples of that every day, but what that in turn has taught me is that the biggest challenges for people running businesses today or in leadership roles like mine is trying to figure out how we can get more customers stumbling across our products more often. You know, I stumbled across that product in a store in LA. I have no doubt if they could get that product in front of more and more people, it would be highly successful because it works so well. The rate at which information has been fired at us is growing at an extraordinary rate. And the change that's occurred in my lifetime, and I know for a number of you I look quite old, but um, it's just been unimaginable. I mean, I, I, was, I was kind of writing some notes from this and I was kind of I was thinking back and saying, if you think what's coming into the home now, I was trying to think back to when the first TV broadcast occurred uh, in New Zealand. Yeah, exactly. You know, it was, it was June the 1st, 1960. Um, it's kind of happened, I was actually born the, the following year, but it's basically happened in my lifetime. When I was a 10 year old kid, we got our first black and white TV screen uh, at home, rented from Tisco, I think. So, you know, that saved us from dad's endless reruns of Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass on the, uh, on the record player. Um, you know, that was only 40 odd years ago, um, and that was, the information. I mean, if you compare, compare it to the day, it's like the equivalent of a tap dripping away to someone standing in the doorway of your house now with a fire hose on full noise pointing in your face. I mean, we are just bombarded by information. So as that product comes flying past your perspective, your vision, and you're trying to decide, is that product relevant to me? Has it been developed and designed to a world-class standard? Is it at a price point I want? To actually assimilate all that information, determine that before that product goes flying past in the fire hose stream and is replaced by a thousand more, is incredibly challenging. And that is the challenge for any of us today in commerce, is to figure out, firstly, how you make sure your product is relevant uh, but then how to make sure that people actually stumble across and can connect with and engage with your uh, product and your offering. What it has to start with is a deep, deep understanding of the customers you're trying to target. If you create a product that is too laden with features that that customer doesn't value, then inevitably uh, that product will end up being too expensive for them and they'll be able to find many, many other products that are designed specifically to meet their need and are at the right price point. Similarly, if you develop products that don't have the features they need, it's not relevant and doesn't even get on the radar screen. So you have to be laser sharp focused at exactly the proposition that you're delivering and exactly the need uh, that you're trying to solve. And I wish I knew how to do that. Um, Fortunately, my job is to ask the questions, but um, you, you know, part of what, what I do know is part of the answer to that is that you need to, under, apart from understanding your consumers' needs, you need to understand the technologies and the mediums your customers interact with and all the available tricks and techniques to attract their attention. So, let me share another story with you just by way of example. So, a young friend of mine 
uh, a young entrepreneur actually from Christchurch here, a chap, uh, uh, Jake Miller. He started a, he's got a, a website running called Unfiltered where he puts on that website uh, interviews with, I guess, key influencers around the globe. People like Richard Branson or I guess John Key and others. And it's a, it's created as a, res a learning resource for, for companies and individuals and so on. And I was having dinner with Jake a couple of weeks ago and I asked him, I said, what's the biggest challenge in building this business? He's 21, he's a really, really motivated and, and early days, but very successful entrepreneur. And he said, my biggest challenge is getting access to people to interview. You know, how do you convince Richard Branson to give up several hours of his time to allow me to interview him and, and, and build this resource for free. And I said, so how do you do that? And he said, well, the first step is you have to get access to them. So he said, I've got a program that you feed all this information into about this individual that you're wanting to contact, and it guesses at their email address. So it might come up with 100 combinations of potential email addresses for Richard Branson. Um, and then so you fire off you know, your email, and now I've got another program that will tell me when one of those emails has been open. And I know, uh, and he didn't tell me if this is how he accessed uh, Richard Branson or not, but I know Richard Branson's email address. There's no way you would guess it. But he has been highly successful. He's found technologies that are specifically aligned to how he's trying to build his business that I'd never heard of. I mean, I was sitting there with my mouth open saying, can you really do that stuff? Well, I've got no idea. But all my competitors out there, if I look at one of my company's icebreaker that you know, I'm CEO of today, the technologies that are available to my competitors to help them to target my customers, they've got access potentially to technologies I've never heard of or even dreamt of. I have to be surrounding myself with people that understand those technologies, understand the technologies that my customers are using and accessing, my competitors are using and accessing, and making sure that I'm not sitting here while, while I'm getting disintermediated and someone's getting between me and my customers and siphoning all that traffic and that attention uh, somewhere else. So it's, it's kind of simultaneously really frightening and really exciting. Um, on a completely different note, the last theme that I wanted to leave you with is I'm, I'm deeply fearful of the disregard and disrespect we have for the fragility of the world we live in. Um, during my lifetime, what I've learned about the impact that we have as people on our environment is kind, is, is kind of frightening. Um, the world's population is increasing and as a result we're consuming the world's resources at an ever increasing rate and clearly therefore creating waste um, and pollution at similarly increasing uh, volumes. What actually drew me uh, to Icebreaker, my, my current CEO role, was the founder Jeremy Moon's deep commitment to sustainability and the passion we all have at Icebreaker uh, to create the most sustainable natural performance uh, clothing system available in the world. What's been interesting to me is how that deep sense of purpose, I personally find it really inspiring, but actually how it impacts people around the company as a whole. Uh, so that, whilst that, per that sense of purpose and that sense of identity and why we exist is really, really important to the customers we have in 45 countries around the world, it also allows us to attract some of the most amazing and talented people to work uh, for our business. The average age of our employees at Icebreaker um, is probably about half my age, to be honest, it'd be 25 or 26, probably about half the age of the average age at, at, in New Zealand. Um, so, I th in fact, I think there's only, we've got 100 people in our Auckland office, so I think there's only two of us over, uh, over 50. Um, that next generation of employees, which includes, I'm sure, many of you, they want a genuine sense of purpose. Um, they want to be able to make a difference in the world. Um, and if you want the best talent out there, what we've found is you have to offer people more than just a job. There's lots of jobs out there, but the people I find that are working at Icebreaker are people that actually want more than just a job. They do want to make a difference in the world. They do want a sense of purpose. 
which I guess brings me to my closing comment. Um, you know, I have learned a lot along the way in my various roles around the world and my various leadership roles. Um, but the thing I haven't learned uh, standing here today at 55 is what I want to do when I grow up. Uh, so if anyone's got any great ideas, um, let me know. But that concludes my comments.